welcome to another episode of In Range. This is a fairly deep video today. And while it's ostensibly about the Sharps carbine, the reality is the history of the movement of abolitionism and the actual events of the US Civil War and the things that caused that to actually occur are so intermixed with the history of this particular firearm that it would be a disservice to not talk about both in the same vein and in the same video. So this video is part of a collaborative series with my friend Andy of Autun Shea Films. This video is specifically about the Sharps carbine, how to use it, its design and manufacture, but also the men and people who used it before the US Civil War in a time and place called Bleeding Kansas in the beginning movements of the violence of the abolition efforts which then led up ultimately to John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. And those videos are going to be on his channel and the link will be in the description below. But what I wanna to talk to you about today is the Sharps rifle, its design, how it came to be, but also how it really became the iconic firearm of the abolitionist movement. So in 1848, Christian Sharps designs this gun it's a breech loading gun, meaning that it loads from the rear. This isn't a time and place when everything else is a muzzle loader that loads from the front. This loads from the rear, much like we would think of with a modern firearm, albeit single shot and loaded with paper cartridges. But the reality is, is that this design was so advanced for its time in 1848 that there was nothing else really quite like it. Manufacture of the gun, its first model, begins in 1850. But in 1851, they redesigned it a little more again to make it more apt for mass production. As you know, if you're a follower of firearms history or this channel at all, that when you first design something, it's really easy to make a couple one-offs of something and make it work. But to make it possible to design and implement and produce in mass numbers is an entire other situation and jump forward. And that's what happened in 1851 with the second model. And in 1853, they came out with the slant breech variant. The slant breech variant is almost identical to this one. This is an 1859 model. The 1853 had brass here for the stock retention ring, had a brass patch box, but more significantly had a slant breech, meaning that when the breech opened and closed, it opened at a more extreme angle in this direction. And they were continuously trying to fix a problem that existed with the Sharps design this was before the advent of self-contained metallic cartridges, in which paper cartridges had no gas seal to the rear of the breech. The design of the gun was intended to prevent gas leakage, but in truth, they never really got there. And the Sharps carbine expels a lot of gases from the top and bottom of the gun at the back of the breech. And as long as the shooter is aware of that and is cognizant of it and doesn't hold it here, for example, it's not really that significant a problem. But one of the things that happened between 1853 and 1859 was to change the angle of the breech and tried to design some elements of the breech blocks to help diminish that amount of gas loss that was occurring at the rear. They never really got there until the Sharps became a metallic cartridge gun, but I digress. At any rate, the 1853, nearly identical to the 1859, is the gun that John Brown and most of the abolitionists used in the time called Bleeding Kansas. So in 1853, the slant breech Sharps, rifle, and carbine is the most modern, newest firearms technology possible. 1854, Congress passes something called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The territory of Kansas at this point is not yet a state, and whichever way Kansas went, pro-slavery or pro-freedom, would actually flip the power structure. The idea behind it was that the Kansas territory could actually vote to decide for itself when it became a state, whether it would be a slave state or a free state. What this turned into was numbers of people migrating to the Kansas territory, both abolitionists who were pro-freedom and Southerners who were pro-slavery, moving there in the idea to flip-flop the power of the state and make sure that when the vote was passed, that it would pass in the favor of their interests. Abolitionists saw this as a rally cry. Many of them formed towns and cities within the Kansas Territory, Lawrence being the predominant one, that were strongly, staunchly abolitionist strongholds. They were not going to let this vote go pro-slavery. 
However, right next door in Missouri and other states, people that we now refer to as border ruffians, pro-slavery forces, would migrate into the Kansas Territory and use all forms of violence and voter corruption and fraud to help change the outcome of such elections. In fact, in one election in which there were only 3,000 possible votes, oddly, 5,000 votes were placed in the pro-slavery cause. Inevitably, this conflict between these two ideologies that could not coexist had to eventually erupt in violence. And in violence, it did. The pro-slavery forces, the border ruffians, again, as I said, tried to enact voter fraud, tried to corrupt the system, but also started harassing and intimidating those who were abolitionists trying to form their lives within this region. Some of these people weren't on either side. They were just in Kansas territory trying to be farmers and ranchers and live their lives. But one really strong example of this border ruffian tactic was their attack on Lawrence, Kansas. They raided the town, burned down newspapers, burned down lots of resources, terrifying the citizens of Lawrence, the abolitionist stronghold, and in doing so made it very clear that if these abolitionists continued their attempts, that worse would occur. It was at this time that John Brown and his family and his small band at that point of militia were coming into Kansas territory and they had been made aware of the fact of this attack on Lawrence, Kansas. Now, first we've got to talk a little bit about who John Brown is, and I'm assuming most of you probably know, but John Brown was already fairly well known as one of the most zealot, staunch abolitionists you could ever find. This man dedicated his life to the ending of slavery within the United States and had already been very active in the Underground Railroad. John Brown wasn't a particularly successful man with his business or his life. He did have a wife and many children and was successful in that regard, but in general people found him very difficult to deal with. He was strange. He was a religious zealot for sure, and that is something that a lot of people don't really want to be around. He always thought he was right in every instance and was very sure of himself in that regard. But when it came to the issue of slavery, he was most stalwart in this regard. The escalation of violence on both sides and the rhetoric was getting worse and worse and worse. And this man decided that him and his family and those that would join him would dedicate their very lives, potentially truly their lives, to the end of this blight. Was friends with Frederick Douglass, spoke with him regularly, as well as Harriet Tubman, and even referred to Harriet Tubman as General Tubman. He helped many refugees cross the Underground Railroad into, into Canada. And if you want to see more about that, you can find a video here on InRange TV about Grinnell, Iowa. So in this regard, John Brown was already well known as a staunch abolitionist, and he had made a name for himself. Being made aware that he was now unable to defend Lawrence as the attack had already occurred, John Brown decided to change his tactics to a different path, one of vengeance and revenge. This is definitely one of the things that most escalated the violence within Bleeding Kansas. He turned away from Lawrence over to the homes and ranches and places of people he knew who were from the South and likely pro-slavery. Some of these people were suspected to be involved in the raid on Lawrence. Some of them he wasn't sure. He went to these homes with his sons and dragged these men out of their home with their wives screaming and crying, questioned them about their motives and tactics, asked them whether or not they were involved in the raid on Lawrence, whether they would answer honestly or not, but more importantly, asked them if they were pro-slavery. And if their answers were insufficient or did not meet with his approval, they were shot in the head or hacked to death with a sword, probably much like this, in front of their family their wives, their kids. And it's definitely one of the most controversial acts from John Brown and his family and his men in the beginning stages of Bleeding Kansas. However, we should also think about this from the state that the reason he was motivated to do this was one day after the, the slavery forces attacked Lawrence, Kansas in 1856, there was actually violence in Congress itself. One of the pro-slavery representatives attacked an abolitionist congressman right in the halls of Congress and nearly beat him to death with a cane. At this point, John Brown realized, or at least believed, that there was going to be no resolution to this cause and to this problem of slavery that didn't include violence. One of the men who was one of the leaders of the abolitionist cause was a preacher named Henry Ward Beecher. He, with his own funds and collecting money from his congregation, started purchasing 
1853 Sharps carbines, smuggling them down into the Kansas Territory to get them into the hands of people like John Brown and the abolitionist forces that were forming there to help make sure that Kansas stayed a free state. So these weapons were smuggled into the Kansas Territory in boxes labeled books and Bibles. And indeed, that's what it looked like when you opened it up. You'd open the crate, there'd be books and Bibles. But underneath that would be crates of the most modern firearm of its time. So the abolitionists, because of the acts of men like preacher Henry Ward Beecher and their Beecher Bibles, were armed with the most modern weapons of the time. These breech-loading carbines had a massive firepower supremacy over their muzzle-loading counterparts. And the border ruffians, in the Battle of Osawatomie, coming with their more historically normal traditional weapons of muzzleloaders, came across a band of the Jayhawkers. Jayhawks or Jayhawkers were the name for the abolitionist forces in Bleeding Kansas, and it was the Jayhawkers versus the border ruffians. And the abolitionists or the Jayhawkers armed with these modern weapons actually caused a casualty ratio of seven to one. The abolitionists were greatly outnumbered, but these sharps with breech loading paper cartridges and musket caps on their belt wounded or killed over 60 of the pro-slavery forces before they were forced to retreat against overwhelming numbers. However, it really was a tactical victory for the abolitionist forces with that ratio. Let me demonstrate for you how the Sharps actually works right now. So Sharps paper cartridges evolved over time, and this would have been the earliest version thereof. This is very similar to an original smoothbore musket paper cartridge, or even the Minet ball paper cartridges you see later in the Civil War, which you tear it open, pour in the powder, etc. But with the Sharps, it didn't work quite like that. This is longer than the chamber intentionally and filled with powder. So you'd insert this into the chamber and this part would still be exposed, sticking out the rear. And as you close the breech block, it would act like a knife and cut open the rear of the cartridge, very similar to how you would cut open a cigar to smoke it. And it would expose the powder charge directly to the flame from the musket cap. Very reliable, but also inconsistent in regards to the powder charge and therefore it impacted on accuracy. And the loose powder that kind of spilled around the breech block made it even more unpleasant to fire than just the gas leakage that was very common with the Sharps. So as these paper cartridges evolved, you see things like this. Now this is a modern Han tube, but it rep reproduces an original historical cartridge in that it's a nitrated piece of paper that is curled around the tail of the ball and the back is nitrated and thin, but it's cut directly to the length of the chamber so that when you insert it, when the breech block closes, it closes behind the cartridge, just behind the rear, it doesn't cut it, but this nitrated paper is thin enough to allow the musket cap to still spark and fire the cartridge. This detonates and either blows out the barrel or completely burns off during the firing cycle, still leaving the chamber empty for another cartridge. During the Civil War, the Union used linen cartridges, which are considered kind of the gold standard of Sharps cartridges. Chamber length, detonating during the firing cycle, and reasonably durable. Let's do some live fire with our Sharps carbine. The first thing we want to do is clear the firing channel with some percussion caps. I've got a little pouch here on my belt, and we got no ammunition in the gun. We're just going to fire a couple caps just to clear the path for that ignition to be reliable. Um, as I said, the Sharps has a pretty weird, obtuse 90 degree turn to get to the cartridge, the paper cartridge, or the primary charge. And so you want to make sure that that's as clear as is possible. So at that point, we're going to put it at half cock, and we're going to take a paper cartridge out of our pouch right here. One paper cartridge, and we stick it into the chamber. Close it. Go to full cock, place a percussion cap on that cone or nipple, aim, and fire. And we got a nice little hit right there. So because these are paper cartridges, when we go to half cock and when we open the action, first of all, that percussion cap will just fall off and then it is clear, it is empty. There's nothing in here. There's nothing to extract or eject. So let's get a close up of this process. Put it at half cock. Open the breech. Now, insert one of your paper cartridges directly into the chamber. Close the breech. Now install a percussion cap, of course your primer, 
go to full cock and fire. The other thing about the sharps is you don't have to use paper cartridges. If you happen to not have uh, paper cartridges or couldn't get them or manufacture them, you can still just use loose ball and powder. I've got loose powder and I've got bullets. Well, all I really have to do is take the bullet, drop it in the chamber. That's easy to do. And quite literally, just fill her up. Right here. Yep. All right, we have loaded that all the way up. Close the breech, any extra powder will just kind of fall out, blow it off. And now we are loaded with just loose ball and powder. Install our percussion cap, just like we would with a paper cartridge, and it will fire no differently. So another advantage of the Sharps paper cartridge carbine, or rifle for that matter, was that you could use paper cartridges if you had them, but if you didn't, loose ball and powder would still work. So this was a gun you could keep running in almost any field conditions. So this violence continues in the territory of Kansas, whether it's with sharps or swords or any other weapon that can be had, both intimidation and voter fraud and the escalation of situation. The federal government eventually brings in the military to try and quell the situation. However, President Buchanan, who was himself pro-slavery, decides that he's gonna solve the problem and forces through two options for a constitution for the new state of Kansas. The problem was the constitution that he tried to put in place or ultimately did mean to put in place was pro-slavery in either way. One version of the, the constitution said that essentially Kansas would be a slave state. The other version of the constitution would say that it would be a slave state, but you couldn't import more slaves than were already there. The abolitionists were of course appalled by this option this was not a free state at that point. These were just two different flavors of the same toxic poison. And it was at that point that John Brown realized the solution wasn't going to be in Kansas. John Brown and his men disappear off the scene in January of 1859, but they reappear later at Harper's Ferry. And that's a video that you can find over at Autun Shea Films. Please go check that out as well. The battle and the raid on Harper's Ferry and John Brown's final attempt of an idea to strike fear into the heart of the pro-slavery forces is in my opinion what ultimately truly started the US Civil War. But what we do know is that the Sharps carbine and rifle and firearms technology, like it or not, is forever intertwined in the realities of US and entire human history. Weapons like this and others like them have truly shaped and dictated our future in instances, they have caused violence that have enabled authoritarians to retain power. And in many instances, they've been used by people like John Brown and others to ensure that people who are enslaved or otherwise oppressed are free. So I don't know what the answers are. And I don't know, and I'm not here to tell you what to think about John Brown's actions in Bleeding Kansas, or for that matter, the Harper's Ferry Raid. I think in this video series, one of the things we want to bring to you is the question about, were these the right answers? What are the ramifications of violence and direct action? Perhaps there's times when that's inevitable. Perhaps it is avoidable. What's the cost of both? Direct action has a cost. Violence becomes out of control. And if you watch the videos about Harper's Ferry Raid, you'll see how that really happens with the very first casualty there. At the same time, not doing something means that situations like slavery essentially continues to exist for longer than it should. And who knows what the cost of that would have been. But what we do know is that there are people alive today, descendants of their ancestors, people who were themselves at one point actually enslaved, who are only here because of the actions of men like John Brown and the abolitionists and the Underground Railroad. They wouldn't be here. Their family line would have been extinguished or worse. And in some instances, they defended themselves directly with firearms provided to them. Again, check out the video about Grinnell, Iowa as an example of that. I don't know. But what I do know is that the history of man and firearms are intertwined in a way that they should not be separated. We have to look at these topics and issues honestly and realistically,
and come to conclusions that are hopefully best for the future. For, as we all know, to not learn from the past is to relive it. But at the same time, we've seen humanity as a whole finds learning from the past to be a challenging thing indeed. Well, I'm not going to say I hope you enjoyed this video because it's a very dark, difficult topic. But I hope you appreciated this video, learned something from it. I hope you go watch the other two videos over on Atun Shea and come to your own conclusions about these thoughts. Dwell on it. Be introspective. Realize the cost that these things had on every side. Not only the side of the enslaved people who were free, which of course was a very important and most important thing to have happen in this country, but also the cost to the abolitionists, the men that died fighting for the cause. Frankly, also the cost on the pro-slavery side or just the pro-South side that was pro-slavery because the powers that be told them that's what they should be. Most of, if not all of the people that were fighting as border ruffians didn't even have slaves themselves were fighting just because they believed that was their Southern cause or worse, were actually employed to do so by a powerful people, planter class, the money, to do their bidding for them. So in this regard, thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope you think about these topics, not only in how they apply to history, but how they apply to our lives still today, and how the echoes of these actions not only that of the abolitionists, but the pro-slavery forces, or just the fact of slavery in this country, still resonate very much to this day. And consider that in all of your actions moving forward, in that hopefully we can find a better way forward. Thanks for watching.